Uh, this is the first time I'm stepping out of my village and as I was about to leave, the people fixing my mother's grave just arrived. But I had to be at this event. One, because I was almost being threatened and intimidated by Her Excellency, um, who literally said I had to be at this event. But secondly, I have some emotional relationship with uh, Omaru Shinkafi, and most of the things I gleaned actually were from your tribute to him. But at my appointment as Bishop of Sokoto, Alaji Shinkafi shocked me by sending me an over 1,000 page book as his special, special gift to me. Uh, it was the book is the history of the Catholic Church. And so I had to be here and I was also very lucky to have spoken with him in his London hospital a week or two before he died. So for me, it's really a great honor to be here. I've got only five minutes and I barely heard what a lot of people say. Permit me if I take a slightly different perspective, uh, in part because everyone is familiar with the narrative. I think what we don't seem to do in this country is to do diagnosis. Uh, I've had all the talk about Gaddafi's weapons and guns and so on. And I think the question we should be asking ourselves about banditry in Nigeria is how and why did Nigeria become such an attractive location for, for, for bandits, banditry and kidnapping? What are the issues that really led to the collapse of our community culture? There are things we never imagined were associated with Northern Nigeria are beginning to manifest themselves. And they've been doing so as in the last 15, 20 years when the architecture of governance, the institutions of patriotism began to woefully collapse in our country. Um, so when we talk, we're talking about banditry, but from the things we had over the NDDC investigations in, uh, in, in, that are currently going on, you know, you will be excused for, for, for um, worrying yourself, so to say, about what is happening in Northern Nigeria. Because in terms of the scale of the financial implications of the humongous sums of money that have been bandied around uh, and the monies that have been in circulation, I'm making the point therefore that banditry is not a cause. Banditry is an effect. It's a symptom of the rot in our society, which is that when you go back to the dictionary or historical or even sociological discussion about banditry, a bandit is a criminal. He's an armed robber, he's armed. But the literature suggests very clearly that bandits operate in wide wastelands where they are law unto themselves. So therefore we must correlate the persistence of banditry, the scope, the length, the breadth of it with the ungovernable spaces that are available in Nigeria. The statistics show that between 64 and 70% of Nigerian landmass, our 925,000 square kilometers, between 65 and 70% of that land constitutes what is called rural uh, land. That means that um, urban uh, participation in life, that is, you know, urban life in Nigeria occupies barely 30% of the Nigerian landmass. We can therefore understand why these human beings are able to run from north to south, from east to west, where they, why they can crisscross hundreds of kilometers without anybody being able to control them. And when we are driven, the second point is to say that, in my view, it is a great mistake that Nigeria has continued to focus on issues of physical infrastructure of violence. Okay, the Nigerian state monopolizes violence on our behalf. But again, if we see what has happened in the last 20, on the last 15 or 20 years with Boko Haram, uh, they, we, they used to call it an asymmetrical war, but it is almost difficult now to say who, is, who has the upper hand and who has the lower hand in this war. That is to say, by focusing on infrastructure, uh, the infrastructures of war, such as guns, such as armor tanks, bullets, and so on, we are ignoring the most fundamental ingredient that generates patriotism. That is the psychological, largely intangible sense and feeling of it, of security that ought to drive patriotism. Most of that is missing in Nigeria. 
And if we go around the whole world from Italy to Latin America, bandits have always been conferred a dubious sense of honor because where the state is absent, that is where the bandits explode. So when people like Pablo Escobar, for example, are able to build houses where the government has not been able to build houses, you now discover that you are bandit. It's only a bandit for the state, but they are heroes in the localities where they operate. So I make the point, therefore, that I think what is most important is for us to bridge this gap because we've not addressed the issue of citizenship and the attendant alienation that citizens of Nigeria feel from their state, from those who run the states, and from the institutions of state that are supposed to serve them. Is it the hospitals? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it the, is it the police? Uh, all the institutions of state in Nigeria are alien to citizens. And I'm happy that you've referred to a multi-faceted a multi, uh, uh, way of, of looking at this issue. When we talk of intelligence, the little, the, the screen you video you showed, apparently, Elijah Shinkafi himself was said to have said something like, people involved with security are supposed to be in the limelight. They're not supposed to be seen. Unfortunately for us, security agents in all their ramifications have become overexposed to politics. And they are also subjected to the same whims and caprices, the same struggle to pillage the state as every other person. So in Nigeria today, you can only talk about banditry in terms of scope. One is better dressed than the other. One is better armed than the other. One is using a pen, he's sitting in an air conditioned office, but he's doing far worse things than the ones who are even risking their life. Because the, the, the modern bandit who is in a banking hall or who is in other institutions of state, are basically doing the same thing, namely looting the state and making the state, making it impossible for the state to meet its basic objectives. The result then is that we have a failure of intelligence because every citizen and every human being can only cooperate or collaborate with an institution or an individual if they can see something for themselves. So if citizens of Nigeria don't feel that the Nigerian state will act on their behalf, then they will side with the bandit. But if they feel that, okay, just a simple example, three, four years ago, we had the, the whistleblower's policy. It literally collapsed on arrival. Today, people who blew the whistle are still not able to claim, and literally all of that has become a whisper as far as the Nigerian state is concerned because it has been crippled by corruption. So I want to make three points, and then I will, I will, I will try and shut up. One is to say that intelligence is not something you read from a book. Uh, the best intelligence comes from ordinary people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to name names, but you know that the late MD Yusuf, for example, was fond of visiting Fela Shrine, where only the seediest elements in Nigeria were congregating and smoking Igbo and so on and so forth. But as an intelligence officer, he knew that from those places, he'll be able to pick the, 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 the kind of grievance that Nigerians were expressing, whether it is through Fela's music or otherwise. Secondly, it is important that the state opens up this conversation because the problem with Nigeria is that ordinary people don't feel a sense that they belong to this conversation. They are being acted upon and they are not actors in their own, in their own uh, destiny. So I think that the first thing we need to do is to go back and creatively begin to focus on the institutions that will engender patriotism and love of country. Right now, as all of us know very well, unless we want to deceive ourselves, on a scale of priorities in terms of what do Nigerians love? What are Nigerians prepared to die for? It is most likely that dying for Nigeria will come almost at the bottom of the list. And so therefore, they're making the case that this is what is opening us and making us more vulnerable and making it easy for the bandits to thrive because the bandits have their collaborators. They have people who are giving them information. And finally, it is to say that in Nigeria, in another five years, our population will go up to 240 or thereabout. So far, if we are not able to deal with issues of management of resources, if we are not able to deal with issues of creating a society that psychologically people can go to sleep peacefully. I've been in my village for just one week. I've received, received several telephone calls. Everybody who calls me is say, feeling sorry for me and asking me, what am I still doing in the village? Because they believe that I might come to harm. And yet this is my home. 
more and more of our elite are unable to go back to their villages and communities. And it is on them that we rely for communities to grow. So we need to be to take the issue of building national consensus, national cohesion, sense of patriotism as a serious and a very important project. Most of that is not happening because 99% of our energy is consumed by politics. And there's very little time left for us to think creatively about how we might build our communities, whether they are faith communities, cultural communities, or other forms of communities. Because if we do that, the bandits will probably find no place to enter. Because they are finding places to enter because most of us have abandoned our communities. I think let me, let me not take too much of your time. Uh, let me stop there. And once again, renew my gratitude. As I said, I had to be here because now that I'm an orphan, I, I, I felt I needed to be here so that, uh, I'm, because now I consider myself a vulnerable citizen. So thank you very much again. And I pray the best we can do for the man we are honoring today is to stick to the principles that he lived and died for. May God bless you all. Thank you very much.